You've got about two or three in my other one. All right. Good evening. Call to order the City of Franklin Common Council meeting dated today, Wednesday, July 5th, 2023 at 6 30 p.m. Madam Clerk, would you take the roll, please? Mayor Nelson. Here. Alderman Hopefer. Here. Alderman Eichmann. Here. Alderman Day. Here. Alderman Barber. Aye. Alderman Craig. Present. And Alderman Hassan is not present. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, item B, citizen common period. Any citizen wishing to come to the podium and speak for the good of the cause, please state your name and address clearly and try to keep it to three minutes, please. Will do. Uh, Tom Taylor, 7014 Elroy Court, uh, Franklin, Wisconsin. Um, a couple of meetings ago, I was uh, trying to finish up and I'm probably long winded, I went past my three minutes, but. I'm back tonight to just inform the council members, especially new council members, of the uh, Chapter 55 of the city code, which is called Organizational Structure. And that, um, I'll just read it to you very quickly. Uh, the corporate authority of the city shall be vested in the mayor and common council, except as elsewhere in the Wisconsin statute specifically provided the common council shall have the management and control of the city property, finances, highways, navigable waters, and the public service, and shall have the power to act for the government and good order of the city for its commercial benefit and for the health, safety, and welfare of the public, and may carry out its powers by license, regulation, suppression, borrowing of money, tax levy, appropriation, fine, imprisonment, confiscation, and all other necessary or convenient means pursuant to Chapter 62.11 sub 5 of the Wisconsin statutes. That means that you're in total control and you run the place just like the board of directors of a major corporation. When you have issues that come before you, like you had the police contract that came before you the last last time, which I think was about $7.7 .7 million, that contract. Um, you were able to pass that and to make sure that the employees are going to get paid because you are in control. You are to work with the mayor, but the common council, the aldermen collectively run the city. And I think some of you know that, but I'm going to point it out because I'm responsible for getting that section in chapter 55. The last thing I'll say is that pursuant to that, if you look at the organizational charts of the city, the mayor has all of the departments report to him, just like any CEO of any corporation. But all the boards, all the commissions of the city report to you, like the personnel committee, which I've had some discussions and a lot of the things that used to come before the personnel committee when I was the chairman of it have not come before it. To me, the personnel committee, the finance committee, and other boards and commissions of the city are your in-house consultants and they are an expansion of democracy within the city. So I would ask you to make sure that you take as many of the issues, especially personnel issues, to that committee, get their recommendations before you vote on it. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to come forward and speak at this time? If not, I will close. See no one. Citizen common period is closed. Item C, approval of the minutes, special common council meeting of June 27th, 2023. Move to approve. Second. We have a first and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, motion carries. Uh, D1, that hearing is canceled. Uh, we're going to D2.
Welcome, Regulo. Thank you. I can read it. You got it. Yeah. Regular. Okay, yep. regular. Got it. Thank you. That's for offering. Notice of public hearing, City of Franklin Common Council meeting details. Hearing date Wednesday, July fifth, uh, two thousand twenty-three, at six thirty p.m. at the Common Council Chambers at the Franklin City Hall, nine two two nine West Loomis Row, Franklin, Wisconsin five three one three two. Proposal information, the applicant is land by, by label, Initech LLC property owner. Subject property, it's approximately located at 7154 South 76th Street, uh, three parcels, totaling uh, approximately 25 acres. Tax key number 7569993021, 7569930016, and 756- Nine 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 three zero one two. The proposal is to amend the future land use map designation for properties located at approximately 7154 South 76 Street, three parcels containing approximately 25 acres from commercial use to mixed use. This public hearing is being held pursuant to the requirements of Wisconsin Statutes, Section 661001-4D, the, the public is invited to attend the public hearing and to provide input. A match showing the property affected for legal description, the application and all supporting materials are available for review and may be obtained from the City Council by way of request to a Department of City Development at Franklin City Hall. The proposed ordinance to amend the City of Franklin 2025 Comprehensive Master Plan is available and open for inspection by the public in the Office of the City Clerk of Franklin City Hall. Any question or comments about the proposed amendment to the comprehensive plan may be directed to the um, City of Franklin, uh, Department of City Development. Okay, thank you. At this time, I'll open up the hearing. Presentation. You wanna start with the staff presentation then over here? That's fine. Sure. Uh, good evening. Thank you, uh, Regal Martinez, Department of City Development. Uh, the presentation um, will cover the uh, the POLF general project, uh, and it will do the presentation of the Comprehensive Master Plan Amendment and the Plan Development District that are uh, associated in this single project. So just for the general location of the project, is close to the intersection of Rosson Avenue and 76th Street, is the re redevelopment of the uh, um, Orchard View uh, Shopping Center. So what the applicant is proposing is a town center development uh, with mixed use. Uh, two of the buildings will be uh, mixed use, uh, vertical, vertical mixed use, combining residential and commercial. And the rest of the buildings will be for uh, apartments. And there's one building that is proposed for a hotel, and the uh, Ace Hardware Store will remain at its current location. And the proposal also include the central area uh, with different amenities like a pavilion, a food truck plaza, a nice skating rink, and some uh, opening space area. And this area here is the clubhouse for the proposed apartments. This is the, uh, the current zoning, uh, that is uh, the red area is B3, that is Community Business District, and the R6 is uh, Residential Single Family. So what the uh, Plan Development District uh, will uh, entail is changing all, I mean, these two areas for a new district, that is the Plan Development District number 42, both general, that's kind of, uh, kind of a custom zoning that is not in the existing Unified Development Ordinance uh, that is um, developed to, to suit this, uh, this project. 
And this is a view of the uh, future land use map of the comprehensive master plan. And the proposal is to change it from commercial use, that is uh, red color, to mixed use. Why? Because, well, this development has uh, the residential component, the apartments, and also the, the commercial uh, use. So that's why uh, the amendment to the future land use map from commercial use to mixed use is required. Okay. So regarding the uh, amendment to the future land use map of the comprehensive master plan, uh, this area, the project is located here, but this area marked in red are uh, areas identified by the comprehensive master plan for uh, potential development, opportunities for potential development. So I will quote the uh, comprehensive master plan in this area. So uh, commercial development along the east side of Loomis Road with existing housing transitions to existing neighborhoods to the east and residential along the west side of Loomis Road represent a significant opportunity for future development. That is according to the comprehensive master plan in the land, land use chapter. Uh, so for that reason, uh, staff uh, is recommending uh, approval of the amendment to the future land use map, and also the plan commission recommended approval on the last meeting on June 22nd. Uh, that's for the uh, amendment to the comprehensive master plan. Do you want me to stop here or present the uh, plan development district? That is the next item that you do. Yeah, we, at this point, we're going to, first of all, thank you. At this point, we're going to stop where we can go over an opportunity. But who wishes to? Or who wishes to see? We have a presentation there, but very similar to what we did. Now we're happy to, but almost. Well, I would think given that choice, there are some that we have not seen it, we have not viewed it, citizen, and also I think it would be a prudent decision to want to see it now up here, and then we can go back to see it as such. And just a reminder when you're talking, <coughs> speak into that mic once you're both. That's like karaoke. All right, so um, thanks for having us. Um, we'll we'll uh, make it as, as brief and pointed as we can. Um, as Regalo said, um, this we've been at this now for about a year. Um, there's been a whole bunch of meetings, both public and private. We're here tonight after uh, the unanimous recommendation of the Planning Commission a couple of weeks ago. Um, we think this site represents, this development opportunity represents a unique opportunity, an important opportunity for a couple of reasons. One, this, is, um, this has become, I believe, the critical quadrant in the city of Franklin, or at least one of them. Um, Smith City's made a lot of big investments in this area, whether it's Ballpark Commons, Vail Village. Um, it is, uh, in a lot of respects, a front door to Franklin. This, uh, this is unique in that um, a lot of these land sections we control and we can plan cohesively, comprehensively, holistically all at one time. So when we think of these projects, including POST General, we're thinking about how do we enhance the assets that are in place? How do we enhance the investments the city has made to date as opposed to um, creating competition with those investments? Um, I think when you when you compare this opportunity to um, what you'd see in a more typical zoning um, situation or development opportunity, it happens to be more piecemeal. That's just sort of the way it works. A developer identifies a piece of land they want to develop. Um, they make a development proposal for it. 
Um, I think what we're trying to do here is is think in a, a little bit bigger picture about how uh, what we do can benefit um, both the properties themselves, but but the wider area. Um, you can see here, um, these are the three brand images from the, the three projects that, that we've been working on that you're familiar with. We're here, obviously, for POS General and later um, Bad Axe. Um, but I put this up here just to let you know that when we think of, of these projects, we think of them, each one of them individually, whether it's the name and where we came up with the name. But more importantly, we think of it, um, it's important to recognize that not all renters are created equal. They're not a monolith of people, right? They're just like, like single family homeowners, condo owners, anybody else. They have different preferences. So, um, and it, at these luxury price points we're talking about, these are renters by choice, um, generally. So, so some folks might want to be close to the baseball stadium. And if that's the case, Bad Axe Flats makes a great location for them. They can walk across the street. Maybe they're big golfers and they can walk across the street. There will be some folks that want a more um, urban environment, more activity. They want to be able to take a flight of stairs or, or an elevator and go to a new steakhouse restaurant. That's what POS General represents. I think POS General, and we'll get into more detail on it, it also represents our, uh, our real estate solution to the fact that like a lot of suburban locations in the Midwest, Franklin doesn't have a traditional sort of main and main um, street format. And so sometimes what gets lost in that dynamic is, um, is, is certain municipal programming, right? So, so is, there, is there one cohesive congregating place that can host any number of community events, whether it's a farmer's market, a Christmas concert, um, a splash pad, playground, those sort of things. So, so we have looked at the public space in POS General as a way to solve for the lack of a main and main um, in Franklin. Um, so in a sim similar fashion that uh, these projects represent a unique um, and comprehensive way to redevelop this corner of Franklin, um, they also generate significant economic impact independently, um, but also when you look at it in the, in the aggregate, it's pretty impressive. So we hired Baker Tilly to estimate the economic impact of the project, and their analysis breaks it out into um, several different ca categories. One being the construction impact, so just the, the economic output that uh, the projects create just during construction alone, and that's roughly uh, $364 million or almost 2,000 jobs. They also look at it operationally, so when these projects come online, um, how much output do they generate, and that's estimated at about um, $40 million or just under 200 jobs. They aggregate that operational impact um, to produce an economic output over the next 10 years, and that's estimated at roughly $435 million. So huge, huge numbers um, of economic output generated by these projects. The one we like to focus on um, or think is super important to the city of Franklin is just the amount of disposable income expended uh, annually um, by these projects. So it's roughly four and a half million dollars um, being spent not just at these projects, um, but in the city of Franklin invested and spent at local businesses and, and companies. Um, so it's just a huge uh, economic generator um, that these projects create. Um, as Regulo um, was was stating um, the sites are also uniquely positioned uh, for mixed use development. So the sites um, are outlined in yellow, and you'll notice that they're um, surrounded by commercial um, commercial uses, uh, which are represented in blue, multifamily uses, which are represented in yellow. And to the extent that they're surrounded by um, any single family uses, we've been very sensitive um, to creating landscape buffers or setbacks um, to be sensitive to those uses. And we'll get that into that in a little more detail on when we get to the site plan. Um, these are very large projects um, and there's, there's a lot of apartments, um, but there's an immense need for apartment development um, in the area and nationally. 
Um, so there are certain national demographic tailwinds that are driving demand for apartments, whether that be from um, millennials or baby boomers or Gen Z or Gen Generation Z. Um, they're all uh, desiring more flexibility or just this lifestyle of renting over home ownership. There are certain economic conditions like rising home prices and rising interest rates that are um, creating more demand, demand for apartments. Um, and that's evident, again, on a national level, but also more locally. So when you look at the Franklin submarket apartment fundamentals, um, rent has been um, increasing um, and vacancy has remained low and is projected to remain below 3% even when these projects come online. Um, so all of these conditions are really driving demand for apartments and we saw all of them kind of converge at our Velo Village um, apartment development where we saw um, roughly 30 units a month um, lease. It was a very fast and successful lease up um, and has continued to um, maintain below 3% occupancy um, and pretty significant uh, rent growth. So just to orient everyone again, so POS General is the redevelopment of the Orchard View Shopping Center and adjacent parcels. Um, it is currently um, a vac mostly vacant and deteriorated dating sh dated shopping center. Um, it's been slated for redevelopment since the adoption of the comprehensive plan um, in 2009. Um, it's been slated for redevelopment since 2009. Yes. Um, as Ian was talking about a little bit of the branding, I just wanted to give some history and context behind it. So. Um, the POS General Store was a, a general store that served the community of Franklin um, for a long time. Um, and it existed at the development site. Um, and we wanted to bring back some of that history and context. It serves as a really nice historical anchor that gives some meaning behind the project um, and relates um, to the community uses and public uses um, that are part of the redevelopment. In terms of the overall um, use or, or program statement for POS General, um, our concept has always been to deliver mixed use development that offers community gathering spaces and public use. Um, it's always prioritized the quality of retail use users and the amount of green space over the quantity of retail. Um, so the site currently includes um, roughly 13 acres of public green space that's over 50% of the site. Um, we have 434 apartment units, a boutique hotel with 50 rooms, um, 20,000 square feet of brick and mortar commercial space, um, and that's focus on upscale uh, dining and beverage options. Um, and it also includes a, a food truck park. And the food truck park really responds to two comments that we've um, heard. One is the desire for more dining options in the city of Franklin and an increase of variety of those dining options. Um, and this food truck plaza, I'll skip to the next um, image here. It's located in the lower left-hand corner. Um, that's a picture of, of Zocalo in Walker's Point. And Zocalo has really been our driving inspiration for this food truck plaza. So it's a permanent fixture where food trucks pull in uh, and remain there and don't leave every night. Um, they, they stay there and are, they're a permanent fixture um, within um, the development. Um, food trucks don't tend to compete with the existing um, commercial space or restaurants nearby. Um, rather, they typically attract a lot of people who come to the site and visit it more frequently um, and drive additional um, uh, diners to the uh, adjacent commercial uses. Um, they also offer, uh, you know, younger startup entrepreneurs who are looking to dip their toe into a new restaurant business an opportunity to test it out, build a following um, at a much lower capitalization than starting in on a, a full brick and mortar restaurant um, from the get go. I would just just add to that that um, in addition to a lower capitalization for the operators of the food trucks, it also um, takes some of the risk of it out um, as a landlord in that we don't have to commit to somebody that might be a startup. Um, we all know the stories about the amount of restaurants that succeed and the ones that don't. And so 
being able to move somebody in for six months, give them an opportunity to prove they can do it. And if they don't work, we move somebody else in to try it. Um, it's a way to, again, to keep the variety going, but it's a safer financial decision for anybody that's in the financial piece of it. The last comment I'll make, and this is admittedly um, a little bit of my own personal projection, but um, everybody um, loves a good steakhouse and fine dining, and we're going to have that here. Um, but I have a couple of little kids, and so I'm not going to say every family works like mine, but I'm not taking my four-year-old to a fancy steakhouse every night. Um, I'd love that love it if if she was capable of it but it's frank frankly more more stressful sometimes than than it's worth so these food trucks offer um, a good place for younger families to go um, they're outside it's less stressful for the parents it's more enjoyable for the children um so this image is a good um or it's a good way of demonstrating the intended uses for the um, public spaces within POS General. So we talked about the food truck plaza. Um, we've always shown a small pavilion um, that could host, you know, a, a small um, or, or host the community band or the high school band or um, a kids talent show. It's not intended to be a large scale concert series um, like uh, occurs at the rock. It's something on a much smaller level. Um, We've included an ice skating rink that would convert to um, a green space for farmers markets or outdoor yoga, but um, the ice skating rink would generate just a really nice four seasons use, um, and we could have an adjacent, you know, um, winter holiday market um, to keep the space activated in the winter time. Um, we've included a children's play area or park area, um, a splash pad. That's one of the things we've heard a lot um, from uh, people in the community. They want to see a, a splash pad, so we've got that in there. Um, and then the last image in, on the bottom is just a representative image of the type of dining um, we're looking for for those uh, commercial spaces. And all of these uses were really driven by the, the feedback that we had heard um, from the community. Um, but to that end, if um, there's something specifically that the community doesn't want to see in here or wants to see in here, we're, we're willing to look at it. For instance, I know it came up in the plan commission meeting and a couple other neighborhood meetings that people are really concerned about the noise that might be generated by the pavilion. And if that's the case, if the community doesn't want to see it, um, we're willing to take it out and, and not build it. Um, we want this to be um, a community-oriented space that people, people like and want to visit. Um, so we hosted two large-scale neighborhood meetings. Um, we also had the plan commission meeting a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had a few one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, and the commentary uh, that we, or feedback that we got um, is, is highlighted on this slide. And I'll t talk through um, just a couple of those changes um, quickly here. Um, I'll note that, that, you know, these neighborhood meetings aren't a unique condition to, to this project. We do that with all of our projects, and oftentimes, usually, um, the feedback we get um, is important and makes the project better, um, and certainly uh, a couple of these demonstrate that. Um, so we heard that the hotel represented in purple here was too close to the condos on the south. Um, so we were able to, to flip it with the other mixed-use building within the site. Um, to the north so that it's set more in interior to the to the site. Um, again, we think it was a, a good comment. It allows some of the commercial space to be visible upon entry into the site, um, which we think is a is a good use and, and position for that um, commercial space. We also heard that some of the parking was too close to the condos on the south. Um, so we were able to um, flip that residential building and put the parking on the north side of the building. Um, that allowed us to increase the setback area to 35 feet. Um, so the, I think the city was requesting a 30-foot setback, and we were able to increase that to 35 feet. Um, that'll also have, you know, additional landscape fencing um, and will augment the existing landscaping that there, that's there as well, which I'll get into. Um, we heard that there uh, was too much parking, um, so we were able to to eliminate um, a, a lot of the parking within the site. 
Um, and we also designated certain parking areas as future parking to comply with the setback requirements um, requested by the city. There are a couple areas um, uh, you'll see in the black circle to the right um, where we changed the layout of the parking. Um, and that was due to the fact that we were, we were on site and we identified some pretty mature, nice uh, stands of trees. Um, so we just kind of bent our parking to preserve um, the trees to create or allow for additional buffer um, and landscaping. Um, we also heard that there's not enough public green space in the prior plan. The laser. Um, in the prior plan, we were showing this zone here as um, the public space and this zone here um, being more of the, the private um, space for the apartment renters. And that was really divided by this um, building here, this G building being an L shape. Um, so in our current plan, we were able to, to straighten out building G, which really allows for all of this um, open green space to become public and usable and accessible um, easily for pe people visiting the site. Um, in doing that, we also were able to, in doing that and also reducing the amount of parking, we were able to identify additional areas um, for stormwater management, which are represented um, in black here. Um, so we can go above and beyond the minimum um, standards for stormwater management. Mm -hmm. I understand there was a, on that stormwater plan, there was a question brought forth, maybe a detailed question about stormwater and that management plan and concerns of the neighbors. Could, could just, Ian, could you just touch on that since I know we've got somebody here that brought that up and I, I know you talk with that individual, but I, it, I'd like to share it with the rest of the group. Yeah, so um, I guess step one is we have to comply with all the legal requirements. The legal requirements are that you can't discharge more water or water at a faster rate off your site than it's in its current condition. So that's step one. This plan satisfies that. Um, step two, as Emily said, is let's see if we can identify some, some areas to go above and beyond what we're legal, legally required to do. I think we've done that here. We've done it through some green infrastructure strate strategies like um, bioswales um, with native plantings, that sort of thing. One of the comments that has come up frequently, whether it's in, in neighborhood meetings or even at the planning commission meeting, was a concern about um, hydric soils or, or groundwater levels um, and what this project might mean for adjoining owners. And, and the short answer to that is um, we dug a number of, in addition to all the typical geotech stuff, we dug some monitoring wells so we could figure out what the groundwater is at. Um, we set our buildings um, to be above that table. So there's really no impact at all um, from this project on, on groundwater conditions. Um, another item that came up was just understanding and considering putting together a strategy um, for the landscape buffers, specifically adjacent to um, the south and the east. Um, so with our plan, we're able to increase the buffers um, to 35 feet. Um, that's five more than was required by city. Um, we're preserving uh, as much of the woodlands on site as is possible, especially um, along the site boundaries. Um, we're augment, augmenting that existing vegetation with additional opaque landscaping. We've agreed to extend, there's an existing fence that extends along the south property uh, line, and we've agreed to extend that fence um, to create additional uh, screening. We've, yeah, we've also agreed to install um, new fencing along the eastern property line to create additional um, screening as well. Um, so all these details uh, will be set forth in our landscape plan. Several of them are already. Go ahead. Uh, so, sorry, um, one, a question came up that I just wanted to address about building heights and how many stories these buildings are. And so just to clear that um, question up real quick, if I could, the buildings that are on here in orange are four-story buildings. 
Um, those buildings were located to the interior of the site as far away from adjoining residential, whether it be multifamily condos or single family, um, as we could. Um, the buildings that are yellow are three-story buildings with underground parking. Um, there are a couple of spots on these buildings, so primarily the, um, the building on the nor far northeast. Can I see the pointer real yep, quick? Sorry. sorry. Um, this building right here. So um, the grade naturally falls away from that building. So if you're standing on the street looking at the building, it's a three-story building with underground parking and you would never know otherwise. In order to create the stormwater management and, and additional stormwater management beyond what was required and preserve the wetlands, the only natural wetland on site is in the northeast corner. Um, rather than grade that area out, we just followed the natural contours. So if, you're, if you were standing in the middle of our stormwater pond looking back west at that building, it might look like a four-story building to you. It's also the building that's in that four-story condition is the furthest from all the adjoining residential. So um, I just wanted to be clear about the heights of these buildings um, because it has been a question that's, that's come up. Um, so the details of the, the landscape strategy are set forth in our landscape plan, which will be um, submitted for, for review. Um, a couple of the areas that, were, that we will install screening buffer, we just wanted to provide some precedent imagery so that people understand what that screening buffer uh, looks like. It's um, dense uh, landscape, um, dense trees um, that, are, that are evergreens that will be um, that will obscure any sort of uh, lights that may um, be directed toward those property lines. Um, so we put together some uh, concept elevations and sections um, because the grade does kind of change depending on where you are on site. So this elevation represents the south property line, the south property boundary. Um, so the existing grade of the properties adjacent to us is actually um, higher than the grade of our property over here. There's existing landscaping here and a fence which we've agreed to extend. Um, so we'll install some more of that dense evergreen uh, screening uh, along the south property line. Um, all of these combined will ensure that no um, headlights will, will bleed onto the adjacent property. Um, here's another elevation uh, to the east um, where you can see there's, uh, you know, very mature existing landscaping. We'll install additional landscaping um, so that uh, no headlights will, will bleed off of our property. Um, in the same vein, um, we were asked about the, the street lights or, um, um, or site lighting for, for the project. Um, we put together this photometric plan and it, it just demonstrates that there will be no light bleed from our property um, to the adjacent properties. Um, I'll also note that our residents um, who live here, choose to live here, will not want bright lights shining through their bedroom windows either. Um, so it's in everyone's best interest to make sure that the light levels are low and not interfering um, with uh, daily activities or, or uh, sleeping at night. Um, I'll also note that the um, commercial zoning regulations would allow for and actually require much more intense light standards um, than what we are proposing at, at POS General. Um, the final comment that we heard um, was we want to see Drexel uh, Town Square. Um, so in the uh, same vein as identifying um, the the uses of POS General, I wanted to highlight um, what Drexel uh, Town Square um, really is. Um, it is a hospital, uh, mixed-use commercial development, a two-acre town center, some fast food, fast casual restaurants, and two large-scale shopping centers. Um, in all uh, categories, um, in terms of developmental intent, developmental intensity, um, it is greater than um, the uses that we're identifying in POS General. So it, it, the commercial uses will generate much more traffic, 
um, the type of commercial uses will generate um, much more light um, and uh, the commercial uses will, will create additional noise with, um, you know, delivery drivers coming in at, at night and early mornings to deliver goods to the grocery stores and, and fast food restaurants. Um, Drexel Town Square also includes um, roughly a thousand uh, apartment units as well. So it's, it's not just um, commercial uses, it is um, commercial and uh, apartment units. Um, one of the things that uh, Drexel Town Square didn't necessarily get right the first time was the balance of rooftops to commercial uses. Um, so originally Pizza Man and Valentine Coffee were, were here, but they have since closed. Um, and part of that is due to the fact that there just wasn't enough residential density. There, was, there weren't enough households um, to support those businesses. Um, so what uh, Drexel Town Square has done as is um, increasing the overall density by bringing more apartment units um, online to create the right balance of households to commercial space. Yeah, this is, um, we're talking about Drexel, but I think it's important to add a little context in that this is truly a national trend that's happening as it related to these town centers that were developed 10, 20 years ago. Um, in that, finding the right balance between rooftops and commercial food and beverage um, has been a little bit of a, a fail across the country since they started. And, it, and the answer is pretty straightforward. You just need to be able to sell pizza or beer or wine or coffee or sushi, whatever it is, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night to survive over the long term. And so adding rooftops allows that to happen. Um, Bayshore is probably the best uh, other local example. Um, the Bayshore folks, um, as part of their redevelopment, decided to reduce the commercial square footage by 37 uh, percent, and they added about 500 apartments. Again, just trying to find, strike that right balance between rooftops, bringing disposable income to your footsteps, and mayor. Uh, so, because you went over pretty quick. So they decided to add 500 more apartment units to that. Something around that number, yeah. Approximately 500 had to be added to this project. Drexel is almost, uh, um, they started with, what, uh, 300? And, and what's been approved, permitted, and TIFT is now up to about 1,000. Thank you. Um, so again, just to summarize the differences between the two, um, in every regard, Drexel Town Square is more developmentally intense, whether that be the number of units, the amount of commercial square footage, um, and the amount of traffic, uh, noise, and light. Just about, sorry, one, one quick note. Drexel Town Center is, what, 83 to 85 acres, and it has two acres of public space. We're 25 to 26 acres, and we have, have 10 acres of program public space, 13 and a half generally. So as a percentage, um, it, it's like 3% at Drexel compared to, you know, nearly 50%, um, depending on how you look at it at POS General. Um, we also start, studied the development intensity um, based on the current use. Um, so the current zoning for the site is B3. Um, and we asked our, our traffic engineer to put together um, just a, a summary of the traffic that would be generated by the Orchard View Shopping Center if the Orchard View Shopping Center was um, fully occupied. Um, and uh, what that um, study determined was that the Orchard View Shopping Center would generate five times the amount of weekday trips, um, twice the amount of morning peak hour trips, five times the amount of evening peak hour trips, and seven times the amount of Saturday um, uh, peak hour trips um, compared to um, POS general. So just in terms of traffic, the existing use, if it was fully operational, would generate way more traffic than POS general. Um, and that's, that's a summary of uh, POS general. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to entertain some 
questions? Yes. Thank you, Councillor. We'll start with uh, Mr. Hofer. Thank you. Could you go back to the landscape plan that you showed, please? And that's the current plan, correct? Correct. And, and which are the buildings that are going to have commercial? Can you see the pointer? So this building right here is commercial. That's roughly 10,000 feet. This building right here has commercial, again, face to the interior of the site. That's also about 10,000 feet. And then this is the hotel, which is considered commercial in the, in the code. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at that, and every commercial business has a front entry customer focused on the backside. Where is the backside to these? Yeah, so, so um, these buildings are four stories. The reason they're four, four stories is that they park at grade. So rather than um, incurring the expense of integrating the commercial into the ground floor of the building, it, uh, you have to think of it more like it's appended to the building. So because of the parking, we were going to have a blank wall anyway, um, and that always creates an architectural trick. So the idea was to put the commercial space up against the parking. That way all you see is storefront um, when you're standing in the site looking at it. Um, one of the tricky things since it's, we're trying to be food and beverage focused here is um, not to get too boring, but how do you, how do you vent and grease trap a, a commercial space that's integrated into the footprint of the building? Um, all of a sudden you're talking about you know, trying to vent um, kitchen smoke, you know, three stories up in the air as opposed to in this solution where we'll have to do some nice screening because there will be residential units next to it. Um, but it's just a more typical delivery. And then the same questions or, or concerns would be for the deliveries mm -hmm. and trash receptacles and, you know, and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. It's, it's hard to see on here. So that's why I'm asking the questions. Yeah, so, so all of that will be detailed in the next submittal, the detailed site plan submittal, but you're raising a good point. So some of the bigger picture questions I can, I can answer. Um, this area right here is meant to be a loading zone. Um, so, so delivery trucks can pull over here and make the deliveries to the commercial space. Um, the service entry will be right here on the commercial. Um, and then right, you can see this little cut through here. Um, so that'll be sort of the back corridor that's appended to the parking that's in those buildings. The trash for both of those buildings will be um, in all likelihood consolidated with the apartment trash. So our management company will collect the trash, they'll roll it out, it'll be picked up. Um, the, this loading, oops, sorry, this loading zone also helps facilitate the farmer's market idea. So. Um, if you look at the, the paths that are on here in this, um, this loading zone area, it would allow vendors to pull up, drop off, and then go into some of the more remote um, parking that's um, to the north here. And, and that's a key detail because you have a lot of, I've got some experience with farmers markets, and if they can't park their vehicle there, then they're going, well, how far do I have to go? And if I have a choice, I'm going to go to the one where I can park my vehicle and keep my stock right there. Right. The other thing, then, a lot of restaurants, uh, you know, meat and produce still come sometimes in a tractor trailer delivery. So I'm just trying to make sure that there's enough room and that it's not going to impede other traffic as you're trying to get in and out, or if you've got all the public space, people crossing streets and things like that. Yeah, so, so you, if there's a full-size semi-delivery, it would still work here. The roads are wide enough, and by city regulations, we have to do that. Um, it, it would be um, more of, I will call it like an urban solution, right? So if you think about, um, if you go down straight, State Street in Wauwatosa, right, there's a bunch of restaurants there, outdoor dining, very similar sort of setup. Those delivery trucks have to stop. They put their blinkers on to get the food in, and then they get out as quick as they can. So they try to, it's more about how do you time those deliveries. Um, I think um, because we're, we're not seeking um, national chain food and beverage here, I think the groups we're talking to and the groups we're going to get are sort of lo good local operators that 
believe in the vision of the deal, they, they tend to be the restaurants that don't require the big mass of Cisco trucks to, to pull up regularly. I think it's a good point that it might happen. If it does happen, we've got a little pull-off zone that could keep it functioning for long enough to deliver the food. And then last question is on your screening plantings, what size are you planning putting in? Because every time we talk about that, somebody comes back and says, well, a six-foot tree won't do me any good for 20 years. So right. what size screening are you planning on initially installing? I, um, it's a good question. I don't have, we don't have the landscape plan detailed out with quantity, uh, quantities and caliper sizes. Um, that's required as part of the detailed site plan. So I don't know the answer. What I can tell you is we agree on the strategy, which is they have to be big enough to accomplish the screening we're talking. Um, it may be that there are select perimeter sections where there's already large mature stands of trees and or a fence and we look at that and we say okay this is sort of third level screening here so maybe a smaller caliper makes sense where that screening is more bare i think we'd look at it and say okay we need to buy a a, a larger caliper wider you know arbovitae um, as opposed to a juniper or a fir tree as i know you also can have higher success rates with smaller trees as well so right thank you right. Yep. Uh, thank you Thank you. Just some real basic um, minor questions, things that have come up in the general public and from my um, constituents. As far as you had mentioned um, that management, you'd be hiring a management company to maintain a lot of the grounds. Does that also include, for example, the ice skating rink, the splash pad, um, clean up, set up everything in the farmer's market? It would require nothing from the city, such as the use of our DPW. Yeah, we're, this is, so we're not asking for any um, trash service. We're not asking for the city to pay to operate the farmer's market to clean it up afterwards. Um, we understand that's on us. In terms of how we accomplish that, it's either we got to pay for it or we'll have a strategic partner. Um, lots of times um, there's nonprofits that form farmers market operations. And so if we found a good group like that to operate the farmers market, we would contribute the space, the time, probably the cleanup, and then we would ask them to do all the organization for it. In terms of, you know, the splash pad, the ice skating rink, um, I'm learning a whole bunch about, about how you actually buy and build an ice skating rink. And, and these things have become, I think is I don't know if it was a COVID thing or 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 not, but as time has gone on, people have embraced the outdoor lifestyle, whether it's you know January or July, and so these ice skating rinks have become pretty ubiquitous around here to the point where I think in the public market they had like one that was about as big as this table um, because it was just something to do. So. Um, Long-winded way of saying a lot of people have figured out a cost-effective way to both build and maintain these these rinks. And then just one other question slash thought, as far as this development becoming, um, you know, our, per se, our city center um, around holiday time and so forth that we hear constantly from residents, constituents, and so forth is there's no area in Franklin that has Christmas lights up aside of the beautiful tree that they do outside City Hall. Is that something that you've thought about? I know it's pretty early on in the game, but or something to consider. I'm not expecting an answer to that this mm -hmm. evening, but. I can just tell you there's a standard operating pra best practice for um, our apartment communities. We provide we will decorate for the holidays. Um, you know, how, how wild that gets is, you know, somewhat de de based on the price and everything. But, but yeah, I mean, you could expect, um, just like if you were, you know, down on Water Street or something in Milwaukee, all, you know, the business districts there have, they all chip in and they hang lights and wreaths and that sort of stuff. Just think of that um, sort of self-contained into this property. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have for right now. Thank you. All the day. I appreciate your time. Uh, uh, good evening. Thank you again for coming in and um, the thoroughness of your presentation. I just have um, a few questions um, sort of on um, the commercial residential ratio piece. 
Um, so I know we referenced um, Drexel Town Square and Bayport as our local examples of kind of how um, a good idea over time has not not worked long term, and they've had to course correct with with more residential units, um, which which I understand. The question that I have is. In our model, um, we have kind of a very small, finite amount of space for commercial. Is there any concern on your part that if the apartments are fully rented, that there's not enough commercial space that people will come in and, and suddenly think, oh, there's not enough here for us to do? Or, um, you know, with the city then wanting to come in because it's the new, the new place to go in the city. Are you concerned that there might not be enough commercial space because there really isn't room to put in any additional commercial use? Um, that's a good, a good question. Um, I'll take, I'll do my best to respond to it. Although it, it's a good enough question. I, you're not probably going to find my answer satisfactory here, but when I look at the situation, do I think there's a chance that this becomes so popular that um, we don't have enough commercial space to potentially meet the demand. Um, I think the answer to that is yes, that's possible. So then the question is, okay, what if that happens? And I think um, if that happens, one of the necessary benefits of it would be what we have hoped to do with all three of these projects, which is sort of spin out that development power to the nearby commercial or vacant parcels. I mean, you just go to the north here up on Ross and right, and there's a six acre vacant tract. Um, if there's a big demand for commercial, that's ripe for redevelopment. It's, it, it would be the same, Regulo can correct me, but it's in that commercial redevelopment uh, master plan area. So that would be a great one for it. You go across the street um, and you look at the shopping center that's there. I think there's an opportunity where you could see some turnover there be improved. Um, so I think that would be the positive benefit of it. The other, the other answer I would uh, share with you is if, if there's not enough commercial space and, and we don't have the demand for it, um, financially everybody's okay. If the reverse is true, we're not financially okay. So, so if, if I build 20,000 square feet of commercial space that cost me 300 to 500 bucks a foot and I can't fill it up, that's a, that's a very painful, um, that's sort of Drexel, what, what happened to Drexel for a time. So that's what we're trying to avoid. We think we've got the balance, but I admit that what you're suggesting is a possibility. And then three quick questions that are probably yes or no answers. Um, for um, the 20,000 square feet of commercial space that you referenced, does that include Harry's or is Harry's in addition to that 20,000? In addition. Okay, and then um, for the, com the 20,000 commercial space, is that um, all food and beverage or is there some retail in there as well? I think it's um, predominantly food and beverage with some select commercial. So if there was a good fitness user, um, that would be in a, a use that I would find appealing to put in here. Um, not a gym per se, but you know, like an Orange Theory or um, there's another one called Bar that I don't really understand too much about, but that's gotten pretty popular. Uh, B A R R E. Um, so something like that, you know, if it was a unique, interesting, if there was a, we've had some interest from a women's fashion boutique, I would probably pursue that. Um, I think there's room for both. And my final question is um, with the ice skating rink and kind of creating a four season space, as you alluded to, um, are you planning for the food truck pavilion to be open year round? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilor. Anyone else? Yes. I, uh, oh. Alderman Craig. I have, uh, I have quite a few that uh, just as you've been doing your presentation, um, just random things that I just wanted to kind of touch on. We've talked previously, uh, Mr. Martin, and I just want to make sure that some of the stuff that we've talked about is able to be, you know, kind of put some people's fears to rest about what you're doing here. So uh, first off, your demographic that you're aiming for for uh, your renters, um, do you have like a like an income target that we're kind of aiming for, like uh, lower to middle class, upper class? What are we trying to kind of attract to the space? I would say it's um, middle, upper, and up. If 
that makes sense. We um, you ha we have a, a leasing threshold of three times monthly income. So so your income has to be three times your monthly rent check. Um, and I think just based on where these rental rates are, that puts you into the middle and up upper territory. So is this kind of in line with what uh, was established at Velo Village? Yes. Perfect. Um, reason why I ask is because uh, the impact on Franklin Public Schools, Velo Village had almost a negligible impact as far as enrollment goals. So I just want to, once again, assure people that are very concerned about whether or not this would be something that would be put strain on our, our schools as far as that goes. When you talk about the programming that would be going on in this space as well, um, what, site, what type of agility are we talking about as far as being able to make changes on the fly as far as what we find is some things that are going to be able to be successful in that space and not how long before anything kind of changes as far as that goes? That's a that's a good question. Some of the amenities that we're putting in here are capital investments that we're making. So, you know, um, the ice rink is cheaper today than it has been historically, but that's a capital investment we're making. So when we make that investment, I'm probably going to say I want to I want to make it work. Um, so that may mean we have a couple of slow years before people embrace it before we would pivot to something else. Part of the logic of making the ice rink um, uh, purposeful in the summer, so you just put a uh, astroturf on top of it, is you can use it for other things. I hope this doesn't. I don't want to build an ice skating rink that be, just becomes a yoga platform. Not that I hate yoga, just I don't want. You know, that's not the idea. If that were to happen, I think we're we're situated for it. Um, the kids' playground piece of it, I think. Um, you know, don't envision giant swing sets and and giant circular slides. What we're talking about are these more naturalized um, sort of play areas. So, you know, wood stumps cut at various heights for kids to climb on. Um, you know, they do things where you have like a carved out old tree that becomes the hull of a boat with some windows in it. So um, more naturalized sort of things. I don't think, I. Part of why I like that is, you know, I played tetherball when I was younger. Um, I don't know anybody that even knows what that is anymore. So, so that's part of why we've done it. So hopefully that's more durable. The balance of this is really blank slate stuff. So, so it, meaning it's open space for the community to use as it wants. Um, so I think subject to those capital investment um, components, I think it really is a blank slate. So we can pivot quickly. Perfect. Uh, one thing I would like to make note of uh, regarding the new plan that as far as your building placement goes, I think um, once again, you've taken care of a lot of the concerns of the community in the, you know, uh, for instance, flipping the location of the hotel. But one of the things that I think is underrated and hasn't been talked about is the fact that with the placement of the buildings you created now what looks to be, at least from my kind of layman uh, view, very much of a very stronger sound buffer for your central part of the, the, the green space. So that way there is less of a bleed of that noise. I, you know, uh, part of my, my district is dealing with some of the issues with the rock. And I think that is very much a, a welcome sort of thing for the neighbors that would kind of border uh, this uh, development, so I, I I applaud you as far as that goes, and uh, I I'm I'm really pleased to see that sort of thing. Kind of maybe it was done on purpose, maybe it was done by accident, but regardless, having that sort of buffer there is, I think, a very strong uh, message of saying that you're going to be very mindful of the neighbors as far as what their concerns are as they've they've come up. Uh, speaking of which, what is the appearance of the fencing going to look like? Is it going to be buried beneath the the, um, the shielding uh, uh, greenery, or is it going to be something that will be part and parcel of that shielding process? Um, the the right way to do it is to um, and and Brian, our construction manager, and I have gone through this on some projects in the past. The right way to do it is to walk the site 
perimeter where you think the fence would go and then adjust based on um, the site conditions. So for example, where we have a nice mature stand of trees um, that run the property line, I'd rather not cut down a bunch of nice mature trees and just drive a fence right through the middle of it. I'd rather relocate the fence to preserve the trees. That may mean that we we go to a neighbor and say, hey, can we put the, would you like the fence two feet on onto your backyard or would you like us to push the fence two feet on our property outside the mature trees? So I think that's how we we plan on approaching it. Okay. Um, do you have any sort of, and this is more of the environmental side coming through, of a zero impact as far as um, emissions go when it comes to like the food trucks and things like that or sort of having much more of a, a electric sort of friendly environment as opposed to having gas and diesel generators and things of that like um that's a really good question i don't um know how to answer it except to say that um the power one of the benefits of doing a more call it a, a more permanent or semi-permanent food truck plaza is that they will just hook up in this, into mean, or, uh, We Energy's power. So there's not gonna be a bunch of churning giant generators blowing out smoke. They'll, they'll plug into to, uh, We Energy's power. Okay. Um, in terms of other green strategies, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, I just don't know. Happy to try to track that down, but I don't know right sure, now. I just, one of those things, I have a 15-year-old uh, son who is very, very environmentally conscious, so things like that would be, I think, would help him sleep better at night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then my last question would be, um, you mentioned the traffic survey. Uh, was that just a lot of hypotheticals that were kind of put together or is that something that was done in conjunction with the county since those are kind of county roads that they kind of have the jurisdiction over in that regard yes yeah, so i think there are two separate things um one one traffic item is a traffic impact analysis and that's currently underway um, and that will study the the traffic impact that our our development will have on the surrounding um, traffic system um, our traffic engineer put, put together a memo of what could potentially be the outcomes of that uh, TIA, and it's really, it's pretty minor things like adjusting the length of turn lanes and, and that sort of thing. Um, but that'll be uh, completed the end of this month and submitted to the city and the county um, for review. Uh, the county and the city both participated in the scoping um, of that traffic impact analysis to know what scenarios or what conditions intersections needed to be studied, so they are involved in that. Um, in terms of the, the scenario um, uh, that we studied with if Orchard View was 100% occupied, um, that was just a hypothetical scenario based on um, traffic generation standards um, set for commercial uses. So it was a, a study item outside of the traffic impact analysis that just looked at the development intensity um, of the Orchard View Shopping Center. Okay. And just to piggyback, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm monopolizing all this. Um, when the, the modeling was done for that, was mm -hmm. that just random Tuesday? This is what it's going to look like? Conversely, were models put together that would say, this is what it's going to look like on a Saturday night yep. when there's a Milkman game that happens. And we also anticipate a great deal of interest because hey, we're opening up this, or um, the food trucks are going to be, we anticipate that the food trucks will be very, very popular and will be, you know, because um, I think that those are going to be two different sort of models coming forward as far as what's it going to look like because the Milkmen game and a wildly, you know, popular like, oh, cool, um, whatever barbecue is going to be there, we're totally going. That's dinner for, for Saturday night. Yeah. You know, and then I think also to, to uh, Mr. Martin's point of where just the proximity of being able to say, oh, you know what, we're going to go there, we're going to go get food there, and then we're going to walk across the street. We will get tickets, we'll go see the baseball game, and then we'll walk back over. Maybe there'll be time to do you know, ice cream or something like that, and then 
then we'll go home and how does that kind of look in, in, sure. in that space sort of thing? Yeah, so the TIA will study and currently includes traffic, traffic generation from Ballpark Commons, from the Rock. Um, it also includes um, uh, the redevelopment of our uh, Bad Axe, which we'll talk about later tonight. It includes our Vitology redevelopment on Loomis. So it includes all the new development coming online and assumes those are all going to happen. Um, in terms of breaking out the trip generation on a on a you know weekday versus Saturday versus um, AM PM peak hours, um, it will break those out. Um, so it'll gen it'll identify you know weekday trips, uh, the peak traffic uh, in the morning, the peak traffic in the evening, and then the Saturday traffic counts. And it aggregates all of them to study um, what sort of improvements might be necessary to facilitate um, safe development, safe traffic patterns um, when the development comes online. Great, thank you. I've been working with uh, my residents and the 5th District. And I've been working with the developer for some time now on this, ever since it came to light May, we started this. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm happy that they're, they're listening to the residents, I'm, I'm, and they're trying to incorporate quite a few things. One of the carryover things that I think came out tonight was the fact that the four-story buildings has been a concern of some of our residents and they're concerned about that height. But I think what you've done is identified which buildings now are actually going to be four stories and which ones will be the three stories. And I think that's very helpful to understand the project. Uh, my comment, my, uh, my ending comment tonight is that tonight we're voting on the zoning. It's not necessarily in regular can help me on this it's not necessarily the content that you're seeing tonight it's just a zoning change in order for us them the developer to move forward to start to put together the things that they're talking about so this is no this is not a final plan this is just a zoning change and saying this piece of property can now be this but we have to develop that is that correct am i that is, that is, that is correct mr barber so that's all well, I regular were you say the same thing go ahead yeah uh, good point uh alderman barber yeah so the ordinance that you have in your packet will provide the development standards uh for this project so for for example for the non-residential area uh, we'll establish the permitted uses that at the same permitted uses there are in the existing b3 uh zoning district I will provide also for the floor area ratio, the maximum floor area ratio that is approximately 100,000 square feet. Uh, setbacks to standards that are the same of the existing uh, zoning district, uh, maximum height, the four story buildings. And for the residential component, we'll provide you the maximum uh, quantity of the dwelling units. That is 500. If I if I may, the and we've touched on it a little bit uh, with Alderman um, Holfer's questions, um, what the exterior of the building looks like, we're, we're we don't know yet. We're still working on it. That's part of a public process. You and I have agreed we'll do more presentations um, about that. Um, you know what the landscape trees look like. What species are we talking about? All of that stuff we have to pin down. Um, that stuff is a is a huge financial investment. We've already made a big financial investment, um, and and if approved tonight, that would give us the confidence to make that that following investment to develop the plans that are also part of the public process. Thank you. Make one last quick comment. Yeah, just to, to piggyback on, on Mike and your comment, um, I recognize that you need this commitment to know that you know we're in favor of the idea. When it comes to that exterior and reading your information, you said each of the building would be different variations of a theme, more or less. And when I look at the what you've done with the paths and talking about history, these are kind of like generic placeholders that you have in here, and I'm not I'm not getting any of that historical or, or that type of feel. I guess my, my wish would be that at least for those two buildings that are closest to the residential, you could maybe try and make them appear a little less monolithic and a little more residential to make a smoother transition from the resident to the more modern, so to speak. That's all. Okay. 
Okay, seeing uh, no more questions, we'll be moving forward. Regular speakers. Well, we have a thing with the open up for regular to talk here, please. I have a few more slides. Yes. Yeah. So, with regards to the uh, to the plan development district, um, as I mentioned, the ordinance will provide a development standard for this uh, new PDD. But I just want to uh, highlight some of the development standard. So, um, so the unified development ordinance allows for PDDs to uh, have more uh, like a flexible uh, design that provide some deviation from the standard uh, zoning district that we have in the uh, unified development ordinance. But there are some limits to the, to the P, to new PDDs. So uh, this table of the unified development ordinance provides the maximum um, standards for new PDDs. So uh, there are some standards that are for residential and the other standards for non-residentials. So with regards to the non-residential standards, so this project uh, meet all the uh, standards, the landscape surface ratio and the floor area ratio. And with regards to the residential standards, it meets the minimum uh, open space ratio, that is the area that has to be uh, free of, of buildings, um, but it's exceeding the maximum uh, density standards, net density and the gross density that is measured in a uh, number of the dwelling units per acre. So you, we can see the maximum here, uh, six, uh, sorry, 6.1 for the uh, gross density, um, eight for the net density that is for the buildable area, for the buildable area, sorry. Uh, and we can see that the proposed density standards are uh, ex far exceeding uh, the maximum provided by the, by the ordinance. However, uh, there is a note in the ordinance that uh, allows the plan commission and the common council to approve densities over these standards with the provision that the development meets a community purpose, such as residential housing for older persons. So that, that, that is the question for, for, for the common council for policy direction. So do the proposed amenities that the applicant is presenting, the pavilion, the ISSK, and the, the food truck plaza, meet that community purpose uh, in order to justify these uh, greater densities. Uh, in making that decision, I would also suggest to see the note uh, from the fire department that is included in the staff report. Um, and then I will touch base uh, just on uh, other um, elements of the project. So for uh, for natural resources, uh, as we can see in the um, natural resource protection plan, there are some impacts to the to existing natural resources like wetland buffers, for example. Just that this ordinance is not approving any impact to natural resources that will require a separate natural resource special exception that will be presented uh, to the uh, Environmental Commission, Plan Commission, and then the Common Council for approval. And just to uh, explain a little bit of the uh, review process, so this is the uh, PDD ordinance for general approval of the development standard. If it's approved, then the developer will need to submit uh, application for either land division or land combination to combine the three parcels, and then submit for approval of the uh, detailed site plans for each uh, individual building. And then the next the natural resource special exception, I, as, as I previously mentioned. And some of the conditions that are included in the ordinance is the submittal of the traffic input analysis. Uh, and in the ordinance, uh, there are some conditions that requires, for example, the, the parking setback and landscape buffer that the applicant has already addressed in the new plan. And, ju and just want to make uh, sure that the, the plan that is included in the packet is the previous plan. So the applicant has already addressed some of the conditions. That's why they have the new plan in the presentation, but that was not in the plan that you have for your packet. Thank you.
Okay, at uh, this point, now we'd like to open up the public hearing. Anyone wishing to come forward again, state your name and address for the record. It's now open. Yes, the public hearing is now open. Please state your name and address. And you could just leave that map open. Uh, just a this question. one right here, sir? Yes, sir, if you don't mind. Uh, Eli Gasavik, 7518 Carter Circle North. I'm in Whitstone. Uh, the, uh, what, Potts General, they were kind enough to listen to our complaints and move the hotel away from overlooking our uh, condominium complex. However, if I'm not mistaken, the hotel is three stories? I don't know, I'm asking. Three or less. But they replaced it with a building that's going to be five stories, and it has a balcony in the back that's going to overlook the entire condo complex. So, in fact, they were kind enough to move the hotel, but they put something even worse uh, in its place. If, if I can go point, point it out. If I'm not mistaken, this is where the uh, four-story building is? No, no, I'm sorry. This is the old map. The hotel is here. This is here, which is a four-story building, and there are balconies all along the back side. So, four-story building. We're in this complex right here. If it's a four-story building, those balconies are going to oversee our backyards and our buildings, no matter how, how big Sir, uh, could I just ask you to go back to the microphone, because we're not recording any of this? Oh, I'm sorry. But no, I'm, we okay. appreciate your viewpoint, but we're... There you go, sir. Right, right, no. So. Obviously, yeah, thank you, sir. So, do I have to hit the button? This one right here? Don't hit eject. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? I, I still, still got it screwed up. That's all right. Oh, oh cool. there, there you go. Right here. So, this is actually a four story apartment building now, rather than the hotel. And this is the hotel. They were kind enough to move the hotel here based upon the, the complaint from Whitstone. Uh, village that's down here and now they're instead they're building a four-story building rather than a three-story hotel and the backside has all balconies to it so people are going to be overseeing and overlooking into our backyards into our homes and everything else it doesn't make any sense they're made they've actually made it worse rather than better that's all thank you that's very kind thank you for listening Hi, Tom Taylor, uh, 7014 Elroy Court, City of Franklin. Um, first of all, I just want to start off. There's something that's going on and has been going on in the country that seems to have permeated all the way through every level of government, and it's this phrase, what will the American people think? What will the people in the community think? We live in a democracy, but it's a republic. And you run to be the leaders and representatives of your community. I used to represent 14,000 public employees. When we would do the labor contracts for, the, for all of these, we would not go to the membership and ask each and every person what they think about it. You know why? because they're not versed in this. You ran for office with the idea that you know better and you can make the right decisions on behalf of the constituents. They are relying on you to make these decisions. I was a prom king, I ran for prom king. This is not about who's gonna be the prom king, who's most popular. It's about who's go what are you gonna do for the community, not today, but maybe for the next 200 years. You're considering something, a downtown, a downtown for the city of Franklin that is going to be around perhaps for 200 years. Your constituents are busy with their lives. In fact, I'm going to ask you to delay the vote on the rezoning because it's, it's July 5th, folks. People are busy. That's why you don't see a packed room tonight. Now, I understand it's probably not going anywhere, that, but I'm raising it. 
And I'm amazed when I went to the Civic Celebration how many people are following this on YouTube. There's a lot. And how many people came up to me and spoke to me about this development? It's a lot. I don't know how many public hearings I've been involved in. It's a lot. Um, shops at Woodstone, or sorry, Wyndham Village, shops at Wyndham Village. I think we had to move that over to the library or to the law enforcement center or maybe even to the schools because we had 300 people. We had Myers that came in. We had a number, large number of people came in. I'm gonna tell you a difference between those public hearings and the ones that have been held and the ones being held tonight. When those were held, we had tons and tons of people coming in support of those proposals. I've been at several of these public hearings. I have yet to hear one person at a public hearing, I guess the reason for public hearings is you want to hear from the public, right? Isn't that the purpose of public hearings? Or is this just a sham? Because every single person that's come down here has not spoken in favor of this. In fact, I think the kindest remark came from someone at Whitstone Village that said, well, can you make it two-story apartments instead of four stories? Everybody wants a, a Drexel Town Square Center. Folks, I studied the Drexel Town Square Center inside and out. I'm a former friend of the mayor, actually all three mayors of Oak Creek. I understand that Drexel Town Square Center probably better than most of the aldermen down there. Here's the difference. Be nice if you would tell your constituents this. Drexel Town Square Center is built on Howell Avenue. There is an airport down there. You have Chicago on this end. You got Milwaukee on that end. You got Kenosha, Racine. You got traffic. On top of that, you've got three railroads coming through there. You've got a port. Oak Creek is not Franklin. Franklin is more attuned to Mequon, maybe New Berlin. But folks, please tell your constituents, this is not Oak Creek. And unless you build an I-94 connection and you have an airport put in, you're not going to get the traffic necessary to support a Drexel Town Square Center. I'm sorry, I'm probably disappointing a lot of people, but the job of leaders is to take leadership positions. Again, I've been at many, many public hearings. It's very clear to me there's consensus up here to approve this. Very clear. But you have had two public hearings where not a single person has come and spoke in favor of this. Again, with shops of Window Village, oh my gosh, tons and tons and tons of people came down. Sendix, tons and tons of people came down speaking in favor. Are you listening to the public? John, Mr. Mayor, just went through the Strauss Slaughterhouse stuff. Yes, and we listened to the public on that. You did, yes. Yes, we did. Yeah, and I believe that's why you're in that seat, because you did. Last piece. And I know you're tired of me getting up here, but I have a feeling you're going to see a lot more of me. Lots. I have my alderman's campaign literature. Bullet item three, he writes, we have three major infrastructure projects that are being conceptually developed. One, we need to expand and modernize the DPW facility. Mr. Morrow, if they continue making the growth and you got more roads, yeah. I used to represent all the guys in the, in the yellow trucks. You bet. He said, we need to relocate the industrial park fire station to better serve the expansion of the southwest section of the city. Growth for the sake of growth is not gonna save tax dollars. 
it's going to cost the people tax dollars. He says we need to erect another water tower. What's that, five million? These all have real price tags. This is not monopoly. It's not fake money. These are taxpayers' money. I urge you to take long and hard consideration of this proposal. Last thing, I'm sure you're happy. By the way, I think the I pubs, have never, pubs are winning. ever told any citizen they could not speak. So I'm encouraging if they want to go past the three minutes, I have never, under my administration here, have never shut anyone down. Okay? Please, continue. John, you and I have known each other for a long time, and you know I respect you. Feel free. <clears throat> the developers, Ian, other developers, it's called capitalism. They're in this to make money. It's great. I told Ian, capitalism, terrific, fantastic. <coughs> but we've had other developers that have come in this city, like Myers. After we went through gyrations and had hundreds and hundreds of people in turmoil over all the stuff, they called me at the last minute after it was approved said they changed their mind. <coughs> Ian's a nice guy. I like him a lot. I like Mike Zimmerman a lot. This is business, folks. Business. They are out here to make money. Your job is to represent your constituents. That's it. Thank you. Leroy Lewandowski, 8030 West Winston Way. What he has just said and presented to this group, I back him all the way. I just don't feel that you people up there have the background that I have of 30 years in this city. That piece of land should be something like a shopping center of a store, grocery store. I live in the general area. <clears throat> I have a, uh, all the woman here, she's never done the things that would protect us. And also, I just want to remind you, anybody wants to put a ice skating ring, if you do it right, you need freezing equipment and scraping equipment to make it level and anything else is a waste of time, and don't put that on the agenda unless you want to spend that kind of money. I skated a lot when I was young, and it was always like Humble Park or something like that. They would uh, freeze the, uh, the cracks and then the machine them. Nobody is going to do that if they're going to just put it out there. That's ridiculous. Again, I don't like this uh, to go forward. I think we've got uh, uh, Mr. Taylor here, and he's doing a good job, better than you people up there. Thank you. Bruce Kanieski, K-A-N-I-E-W-S-K-I, 7719 West Coventry Drive, Franklin. Okay, I had my notes listed out here, but based on everybody else's comments, I could probably go on forever. But I'm going to try to stick to the, the subject of the public hearing, which is the comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, might get into other subjects, but I apologize for that it, because uh, there are some things to be said. But however, uh, contrary to what several of the previous people spoke, I generally concur with this proposal. Uh, this is not dissimilar to uh, my long-term thoughts going back 25, 30 years of what could be done with this property for mixed use. Uh, but I do have several reservations I want to share with you and hopefully consider those. Uh, one of the things I think the city should do, uh, if not included with this change of the comprehensive plan, but 
in the media future also change the land use plan for the neighboring properties within, within this quarter quarter section. Because I think those properties, such as Walgreens, McDonald's, the bank, daycare, and the Brun property, especially the Brun property, because uh, those sites will be having, I, I predict, within two to three years, maybe five years at most, redevelopment proposals coming before you or a future Common Council because of this project. Um, and one of the, the things is um, traffic. And I know there's not a TIA or a t traffic impact analysis completed for this proposal yet. I think that's personally, as a planning professional, that's putting the cart before for the horse, not having the TIA before you approve a project like this. And contrary to what was just said a few minutes ago, uh, you are proving, with, as I see and read this afternoon, the PDD as drafted by staff for your, the ordinance, that you are approving the basic site plan for this uh, proposal, although there, you know, there could be tweaks to it. But the general layout is, as I see it, basically set in stone. Yes, they have to come in for architecture, landscaping, so on and so forth. But, uh, but on the developer's website today, I found the completed traffic impact analysis for the D1 <laughs> proposal that was on your agenda. And that has a lot of information about this project, or about 76 and Rawson TIA. And, uh, and I disagree with the comment earlier that there could be minor improvements needed to 76th Street and Rawson Avenue. Uh, there is proposal for, in the, how you pronounce that, phy phy phytology, phy whatever, that, that project, in, in their TIA, that uh, increasing the, the westbound left turn lanes, uh, which I agree, yes, <laughs> that's very short, needs to be changed. I go through, through quite, after, quite often, going back to my home after I go to McDonald's, maybe once or twice a, a, a week in the morning for breakfast. Uh, but uh, there's extending that left turn lane is going to close off those ex accesses. If they're not already uh, closed off, I see in this site plan. I didn't notice that before uh, earlier today looking at the site plan, but it looks like that access between McDonald's and, the, and Chase Bank is being going to be closed off. Uh, so I project that there's going to be other uh, re redevelopment proposals by the other, those other properties because you're closing off their access points and uh, more access will be more difficult. And I know people are creatures of habit. People are accustomed to the traffic patterns there. This is not no longer when in 1980s when Ross and, and Drexel, I mean, excuse me, Ross and 76 were two lane highways with flashing four way light at the intersection. Right, Jesse? Do you remember that when you first moved, when you first moved to Franklin? But anyways, uh, and the uh, D1 traffic, TIA uh, states that there's going to be two more traffic signals added between uh, Imperial and Ballpark Drive. So within that mile stretch, there's going to be traffic signals every 880 feet or two and a half football fields. So uh, think about that and traffic. And uh, while I was eating dinner tonight, I was thinking about that, how I would now try, you know, obviously living in Tuckway Green, my wife and I, Traveled north, found quite a bit uh, out of our subdivision, but probably the better route now was going to be taking Brun Drive all the way to 6A Street and cutting through that subdivision and Dover Hill Estates. So that, uh, so I think uh, the the TIA needs to be completed before you go forward with the comprehensive plan amendment. I concur with uh, the applicants uh, in their written uh, report that there should be uh, connectivity, but I encourage all of you, the Common Council, the decision makers, the people uh, that control the, uh, the purse strings to extend that to this whole area. Uh, uh, actually, a couple of years ago, I thought when I retire, I'm gonna try to get on uh, the, uh, or make a proposal that for more walkability at this intersection because north of Rawson, it's terrible. 
uh, trying to get to uh, the rock from the south side of Rawson. Uh, so, you know, with this project, take this as a stepping stone to improve connectivity, both uh, pedestrians and multi-use trails for bicycles. Uh, lastly, or not, but, well, wait a minute, I got a couple more comments <laughs> now that I wrote in my margins based on the comments from tonight, everybody's comments tonight. Go ahead, sir. But uh, the fire department, I saw in the staff report that the fire department has major concerns about uh, uh, service delivery with the, not only this proposal, but expanded propo the other proposals going on in the city. Uh, I concur with that because to tell you the truth, I, I, I think we have an excellent police and fire department. Uh, just a few months ago, a uh, young relative of mine had a medical emergency and her mother was ecstatic at the quick service and by the paramedics and the quick delivery. In fact, from our house in Tuckway Green, I can hear when apparatus feels, uh, leaves station one. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm satisfied with that quick response and, and uh, I sleep well at night thinking, knowing that there is uh, great service nearby for emergency ac accessibility and emergency response. Um, so one a couple other uh, comments. I just have, I have, have to, if, I, if my wife sees this on YouTube or whatnot, I, I, would, I would hear from her to be remiss about the landscape buffer that was brought up by the applicant or landscape buffering. Hopefully the city will implement that and enforce it, Jesse, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, let's leave it at that. And then, uh, so lastly, while I concur with this proposal, I, I don't think, as I stated, not all factors have been considered, and uh, that the amendment to the comprehensive plan should go forward, and then obviously being consistent with the state law that you should go forward with the uh, rezoning. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak at this public hearing? Come forward at this time. Hello, I'm Norman Knox. I live at 7411 South Williams Court in the sub, uh, Whitstone subdivision. Um, got a couple of questions I've been looking at. I'm in the projects, you know, so I'm always asking. Uh, one thing I see is McDonald's. I don't see uh, we're be more than likely to be closing that entrance on the uh, top there where they get the square going around because of uh, traffic. They close that off, how are their customers going to get to McDonald's? They've got a single, you know, a double driveway that has basically where their drive through comes out, and that'll be it. <clears throat> uh, unless they're driving through the whole subdivision trying to get to McDonald's. Uh, second problem is. Truck deliveries going to those buildings, they're saying that they can you know, pull up. Okay, the trucks that are making deliveries, they're not going to be able to back back out or turn around. Their space isn't big enough there for their park in their parking lot. So they're going to have to have an exit going out where they can drive forward to be able to get out. And I don't see where that's going to be accessible uh, on the maps that they have now. Uh, as far as the number of units go, I would prefer to see 250 units or maybe less rather than 440 for the simple fact that we're getting so high and like one of the other gentlemen was saying about uh, uh, the houses along the fence line on Whitstone Village, their, house, their living rooms and their bedrooms are facing this property. So if they've got a high building there, people are able to look down into their living rooms and their bedrooms. Um, so I, in my proposal, if they kept it down to 250 units, they be wouldn't be have, have to go so high, and they, they should still have enough business there to take care of their different vendors that are in business. So that's where I'm at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, anyone else wishing to speak? If not, I will close the public hearing at this time. Public hearing is closed. Uh, going on to letter E, organizational business, there is none. F, no letters and petitions. Going into G1. In ordinance to amend the City of Franklin 2025 Comprehensive Master Plan to change 
the City of Franklin 2025 Future Land Use Map for properties located at approximately 7154 South 76th Street from commercial use to mixed use, approximately 25 acres, land by Livable LLC applicant. A motion to adopt. Second. We have a first and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Mr. City Attorney. My understanding is that the motion was to adopt the ordinance in the form and content as presented to the council at this meeting. Yes. By the way, I think there's a typo in there. Okay, uh, item two, in order to create, yes, it went unanimous. Item G2, in order to create section 15-3.0447 of the Franklin Unified Development Ordinance establishing plan development district number 42, Poths General, and to rezone property from B3 Community Business District and R6 Suburban Single Family Residence District to Plan Development District Number 42, approximately address of 7154 South 76th Street. A motion to adopt. Second. With the language added from Jesse. Okay, that's a first, and we've got a second. Any further discussion? Okay. Mr. 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 City Attorney? Meeting the motion to approve the ordinance in the form and content as presented to the Common Council at this meeting. Is that correct, Mr. Barber? Yes, it is. Today. Mr. Holt for discussion. Uh, I would just say that I'm in favor and support the, the change in the idea. Um, I've had numerous conversations with both my constituents and, and residents outside of my district, and I've run the whole gamut of, of feedback. I've had uh, one person tell me, fix the parking lot and leave it as, as it is and do a better job of supporting local businesses. I've had people coming in and asking for stores and establishments that there's no way we're ever going to get. But I'm encouraged by the number of people that I've talked to and, and had communications with. Sir. Uh, that point of order. Point of order. Please. Mr. Holford, please continue. I'm, I'm encouraged by the number of people that I've talked to who said, I have reservations. I appreciate the willingness of the developer to work with us, and I think we're close, but we're not quite there yet. So I, I would like to approve the change, knowing that we have some flexibility in getting where we actually need to be. Thank you. So we have a first and a second. There was a redraft ordinance handed out to the Common Council and some staff at this meeting with corrections to the ordinance, which was in the Common Council agenda meeting packet. And I dare say it was very minor and only went to referencing the date of approval and adoption of the resolution by the plan commission in maybe a couple of spots. Mr. Barber. I went through the uh, change and it, although it's not highlighted on the change sheet, um, the change that I've been able to discern by going through and rereading both of them side by side had to do with section one, and it's simply adding within the plan commission resolution number uh, two, and it added the 007. So it, it's very minor. In the future, I could 
you know, would, would probably suggest that we highlight these areas where there is change or additions before it's presented to us at the table. So we don't have to read it that night and go through it side by side. I agree. So um, that is the one change that I've found there, and it, it is minor. Mr. City Attorney? Only that uh, Alderman Barber is referencing the G1 comprehensive right. master plan draft ordinance. Um, and I spent another 4th of July working, <laughs> which is when I saw the need for corrections in some council items and held back from emailing staff on a holiday. So I did it first thing this morning. Thank you. The first and second, we've got a vote. Item. Uh, this has already been voted on, passed unanimous. We're going on to item G3. No, we didn't vote. Oh, we didn't vote on this one. Oh. It's got crazy all the discussion. Okay. Roll we call. have first and a second. Roll call. Let's do a roll call vote, sure. Adam Clerk, roll call vote, please. Alderman Hopefer. Aye. Alderwoman Eichmann. Aye. Alderwoman Day. Aye. Alderman Barber. Aye. Alderman Craig. All right. Five ayes, no no, one absent. Motion carries. Item G3, a resolution imposing conditions and restrictions for the approval of a special use to increase the maximum permanent density for a three-story mixed-use building upon property generally located at the southeast corner of West Ross Avenue and South Ballpark Drive, Bad X Flats LLC, applicant Zimmar Properties LLC property owner. G2. Motion to adapt. Second. We have a first and a second. Any further discussion? Um, Alderman Craig. I think that there is uh, some, some validity to send this back to the planning commission so that way the items that were brought up by the planning manager can be addressed before we adopt the uh, assistant plan. The, the, change, the changes of the, that are uh, prescribed within. Okay, so is your is your motion then to send this back to planning for what exactly to address for the for the planning manager to uh, have their their con and I I don't know if I can make a motion because there's already a motion right but we'd have know. to I'm going to go back to that so if you're I think that there's something to be said for the planning manager to be able to address some of the 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 issues that she had with it with such as uh, development unit size and the uh, the uh, landscape requirements that were discussed and were tabled at the planning commission okay uh hold on mr martinez and i, I see you michelle so the adx uh, project has two applications it's the special use that you you have in front of you tonight that is to uh, increase the maximum permitted density for uh, from what is basically allowed under the current PDD, approximately 16 uh, dwelling units to a maximum of 81 dwelling units. That's the special use. Then the site plan, that is basically the design of the building, compliance with all the standards of the PDD, uh, dwelling unit size, landscape requirements, was tabled uh, by the plan commission because uh, I was not uh, in compliant with the code so the applicant is working on revisions to the site plan and will present the site plan again uh, for review and approval of the plan commission okay. All the one I, can... uh, I yield okay so we have some discussion for the discussion we we'll go first and second the paper the motion Mr. Martin, simple terms, what the site plan tabled by the plan commission is the item with concerns that were met mentioned by Alderman Craig, right? Correct. So that's not before the common council, okay. but the special use resolution is before the common council. Correct. And the, the plan commission recommended approval of the special use and tabled the site plan. 
Thank okay. you. So it's a special use only is what we have the first and the second on the motion. Okay. Question. Mr. Hofer. So in theory, what would happen if we approve this and they can't come into compliance on the other issues? The a special use, a special use is approving a maximum of the welding units. If they cannot comply with the standard of the UDO, they can reduce the number of the welding units to comply with the standard of the UDO. But they're coming asking for to exceed in the first place. So what I don't want to get into a situation is where well, you approve me for these and I can't meet the I can't meet the standards, so now I want an exemption. Well, uh, the applicant may request a separate uh, variance or amendment to the PDD, but that, that will be a separate uh, process and application. Uh, however, the special use resolution has a condition that the site plan needs to comply with the Unified Development Ordinance and the PDD. It's only approving the number of dwelling units but it's not approving any deviation from landscape requirements or the dwelling unit size. Very good, thank you. To uh, just go back here, who made the first and who made the second? I made the first, I'm the second. Okay, you got that, Madam Clerk? Okay. Uh, so, you know, for the discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I say I have a motion carries. Uh, G4 has been tabled. Oh, Mr. City Engineer. You may say whatever you wish, sir. All right. Um, so you see something revised on your table tonight basically changes the funding, how you're planning to pay for it. Um, I will tell you that there's a resident, adjacent resident, that came in today and asked that we table it. Um, he would like us not to put up a street light. Um, I have to think about that for a few weeks. I guess I'm okay to table it. Uh, there's a concern that we, we, as practice, we try to put a, a light at every intersection. Uh, we get a couple requests a year where people ask us to put up lights where we don't put normally put lights up. So I have to think about what that would in this area, uh, whether we should or shouldn't. So I'm okay if we table that for two weeks. Okay, can I, do we need a motion to table it? Or we, okay, is there a motion to table? I'd like to. Oh, put over. Second. To put over till the next meeting or next meeting. to put over to the next meeting is fine. I'm sorry, all the women? Yes. Oh, next did you make regular? Next regular meeting of the City of Franklin Common Council. The motion. Uh, Mr. Rolfer made the motion? Yes. Okay, I second, second it. it. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. G5, a resolution authorizing certain officials to accept a conservation easement for and as part of the approval of a certified survey map upon property located at 6317. West Oakwood Road, the City of Franklin, Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, Stuart M. Wangard, member of Oakwood Industrial LLC, applicant, D4. Move to approve. Second. Mr. City Attorney. Worked with the applicant and staff today, and the applicant has made Changes to the signature provisions, which are now okay, and also also. So it's okay for processing, but it does not match the one in the meeting packet. I'm going to have to start tabbing every one. And on my double check, just as I recall, the resolution to approve does include subject to review and approval by the Department of City Development and technical corrections by the city attorney. So it's a okay to move forward, and I just thought should be informed of that change. 
change changes being made. Okay, we have a uh, first and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, ayes have it. Uh, G6, Von Briesen and Roper, SC attorneys request for potential conflict of interest informed consent waiver with regard to the performance of legal services for the City of Franklin upon labor matters and also to represent Fox Glen Corporate Center, LLC, in the pending municipal court matter, City of Franklin versus Fox Glen Corporate Center, case number N is in Nora 142766. Mr. City Attorney. As stated on the action sheet, the conflict with the, the other law firm uh, providing employment council services to the city, which is totally unrelated to a private matter, which is in municipal court. So, and uh, engineering department and legal services department has, has uh, no problem with uh, approving the waiver of the conflict. And motion to authorize. We've got a first, Mr. Barber, a second, Mr. Holford. See no further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Aye. Item G7, authorization for execution of standard service contract between Heartland Business Systems and City of Franklin. Police Department budget $247,000, capital LA budget account 46-0211-5812.7. City Hall budget, $350,000 capital LA budget account 46-0181-5499. Public library budget, $25,000 capital LA budget account 15-0511-5822. Good evening, sir, you have the floor. Yes, uh, this ties to the video surveillance projects that are going to be going underway. Okay. Um, Cabling is going to begin next week uh, over at the police department. Even though we have a agreement with the department that spans over 20 years, I don't think they have ever signed a city state agreement on it. This is really good practice to go ahead and make sure to turn around and the services renders forms to our state to replace the contract. Uh, or, uh, we did make there were some minor changes, particularly on insurance. Uh, that the council was able to obtain here. A uh, few minor adjustments that were made, hence the hotel uh, board. With regard to uh, the item G7 handed out at the meeting, um, the changes were to the insurance provisions. On, well, first of all, the first line changed the 15 day of, I think it was of May. So now it would be executed and the date would be the day in July that the city signs it. And on page three, um, the general commercial liability um, coverage was uh, reduced from 1 million and uh, from 2 million and 4 million um, for the each occurrence and her general aggregate to 1 million and 2 million and the umbrella or excess liability coverage was increased from 10 million to 15 million and also um, what's a copy of which is handed out before you is that redraft with the now being signed by the president of Heartland Business Systems LLC. Motion to authorize the execution. Second. Oh, Mr. City Attorney. In the form and content as presented to the Common Council at this meeting. Yes. It's your amended motion, Mr. Barber? Yes. You go with that? I am, thank you. Madam Eichmann. Seeing no further discussion, uh, all those in favor? Oh, Mr. City Attorney. And the attachments in the Council packet um, are included with the form and content handed out to the Common Council at this meeting so that should be included in the statement with regard to the motion yes that's your third amendment motion sir yes. mr barber yes yes me. alder one i can second good any other further discussion i was going to pause for a minute seeing none all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed ayes have it thank you very much it's exciting excellent uh g8 
A resolution to execute an agreement to relocate a sanitary sewer main across the Alice Roller LLC property at 5801 West Franklin Drive, text key number 931-9001-000. Mr. City Engineer. Our industrial park lift station project is, is proceeding and we did finally receive uh, the, uh, the generator. So it, uh, we've been waiting a long time for that. It's finally in. Now our contractor can, can get things finished and get it all buttoned up. Meanwhile, Alice Roller is looking to expand their building. By expanding their building, they're going to, if you will, take out a, a, um, a lar rather large sanitary sewer that's feeding our lift station. And so they have a plan to relocate it. Um, you see the exhibit at your, I passed out at your uh, places tonight. And Alice Roller is willing to pay us so that we would pay our contractor to get the sanitary sewer to the edge of our property. That way our contractor can can finish up the asphalt, landscaping, and, and so forth without doing all of that, then having Alice Roller come in six months from now and tearing everything up and trying to rebuild it. So it makes sense from a, a procedural standpoint. Uh, we've worked through an agreement that you see in your packet. Um, we are expecting an exhibit. This is not the official exhibit. Uh, I expect to see, get that in the next few days. So um, assuming Alice Roller doesn't have any as I understand, they, they don't have any comments on the proposed agreement. So if you're okay with the agreement, we can work on getting that signed with Alice Roller. And we'll be back here with a change order with our contractor to get this done. It's about $80,000 worth of work. It makes sense for us to do it with our contractor now and get it done with. It makes perfect sense. Uh, any further discussion? Is there a motion? I'll I would move to approve. Oh, Mr. Rolfer? I'm just to say I would move to approve, but if she's gonna... Okay. All the one day? Either way. Approve. Okay, so why don't we go with Alderman Day is a motion, Alderman Holfer is a second. See no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it, motion carries. Item G9, a resolution for Rukert and Milky Inc. to complete a sanitary sewer impact fee study for $7,000. So move. Second. We have a first and a second, Barber and Jason. Quick question. Oh. Do you have a timeline for when it would be done? Um, the direction will be as quick as possible. I don't have a timeline. Are you talking months or? I would imagine a couple months. There's some procedure things that have to they have to go through. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Item G10, authorization to execute an agreement with Industrial Roofing Services, Inc., IRS, to provide study, review, and plan preparation services for the City of Franklin Ken Wendell Park facilities as part of an enhanced capital improvement plan, CIP. Mr. City Attorney. With regard to the certificate of insurance in the council meeting agenda packet, um, we communicated with them today and they changed it, and there is a handout for this item G10 in front of you. And uh, the highlights that I did on the, it's in the second box from the bottom, uh, description of operations, et cetera. Um, it now clearly states the city is an additional insured on a primary non-contributory basis for general liability, automobile, and umbrella policies. Um, as required in the contract. So move to approve. Second. Second. We have Mr. Hope for Mr. Barber. Seeing any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Item G11 Agreement for Professional Services to provide assessment services between the City of Franklin Count. City of Franklin and Accurate Appraisal LLC, the Common Council may enter into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin State Statute 1985, sub 1 sub e, for competitive and bargaining reasons to continue to deliberate and consider terms relating to the agreement for professional services to provide assessment services between the City of Franklin and Accurate Appraisal LLC entered into on February 7th, 2022, and the performance thereof and the investing of public funds and governmental actions in relation thereto, and to re-enter open session and to the same place they're apt to act on such matters discussed therein as it deems appropriate. Mayor, did we want to... Um, I know what you're going to say. I'm anticipating it. Go ahead. 
read my mind then. Um, did we want to complete H and I? Well, I, I understand that was the past practice of doing it. It doesn't really matter. We're going to hit it either way. So let's just continue with this one, then we'll go to H and I. Thank you. But I did read your mind a little bit because we. Okay, it is 9, 10 p.m. We are back in open session. Do I have a motion? Motion to proceed as, sorry. Go, go ahead. Uh, we, have a, we have a delay over here, the blanks there. So go ahead. Motion to proceed as discussed in closed session. Okay. Have a first. Get. Easy part to say second. Do you have a second over here? Second. Second by Alder Obede. See that further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Is it, is it, are we squabbling? No, not at all. Uh, let's go to H. Uh, who's doing H? Bottom and Craig. Uh, we met with the licensing committee uh, again, and we have three pages worth of applications. Good news. Much lighter than usual. Uh, page one, all are approved. There are two that are will be approved pending the correction of their application. That would be Josephine Garcia and Meredith New. Page two, all are approved. Uh, Catherine Smith also needs to correct their application. However, uh, Maname Sao needs to appear before the uh, the licensing committee as well. And page three, all items, all three items are approved. Um, Alderman, I had a question. Yeah. Okay, so it was. Alderman Eichmann, you've got the floor. Madam, and so for the operator, no location, the second from the bottom on page one, was that going to be a, for appearance and correction of application or just correction of application? Just a correction of the application. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, Councilor, you got the floor. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Second the motion. Okay, we've got a first, second by Alderman Barber. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Uh, aye. Vouchers and payroll approval. Move to approve. A motion approving the following city vouchers with an ending date of June 29, 2023, in the amount of $872,194.58, and payroll dated June 30, 2023, in the amount of $471,496.96, and payments of the various payroll deductions in the amount of $448,384.80, plus city matching payments and Estimated payroll dated July 14, 2020, 2023. In the amount of $660,000 and payments of the various payroll deductions in the amount of $320,000 plus city matching payments. So Second. Moved. So we got Barber and Holfer. Roll call, please. Alderman, <clears throat> Alderman Holfer. Aye. Alderman Eichmann. Aye. Alderman Day. Aye. Alderman Barber. Aye. Alderman Craig. Aye. Five ayes, no noes. Unanimous motion carries. Motion to adjourn. So motion. Move. Second. We've got a first with Holfer, a second with Eichmann. All's in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. It is passed and off the record. Good meeting, Mr. Are we off? Facing ourselves. Is this still happening?